namasta sukhe lo bhavantu loka samasta sukhe lo bhavantu It's my blessing to welcome you. And uh, first off, we dedicate our efforts here this afternoon to a vision of a springtime of humanity, where all humanity makes a leap in consciousness and realizes the unity and divinity of all life, where we cherish our Mother Earth as our own mother, where we share with each other as brothers and sisters. Aho Natakuyasi. And for those of you who are new, two caveats. First of all, uh, we appreciate that nobody really knows, neither scientists nor sage really knows what we're doing here, what we're made of, or what we, uh, or where we're going, <laughs> where we've come from or where we're going. It's a great and wondrous mystery that anything is or that we are. So everything that we we, we do here, we offer as a hypothesis and as the fruit of a lifetime's contemplation, but it's offered in a humble way. Secondly, uh, I'll be drawing from the wisdom of ancient India, a wisdom that calls itself the Sanatana Dharma. Sanatana means timeless, older than time itself, older than this creation. And Dharma is a way of life that if we uphold it, it upholds us. It's a way of life uh, in which, uh, as we practice this way of life, we experience the sacredness of all life. Today, as always, we'll be contemplating the unity and divinity of all life. And I'd like to begin um, with a, an invocation to higher intelligence. This is the, the widest scope and widest in scope prayer that I know here. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Oops, what happened here? Where are you? Can I do the transition? Well, it doesn't seem like it's showing up here. Well, software, what are you doing here? Let me see if I can do it this way then. Uh, no, it's not up here anymore. Okay, well, what are you going to do? Oh, that's what happened. But we're not going to worry about that. The invocation without an illustration. I am that. Without boundaries, limitation, separation, I am a universal life of indescribable energy and unlimited consciousness. The stars and the planets are the cells of my body, and I am filled with indescribable energy and unlimited consciousness. I'm willing energy from that that I am, Mahavishnu, the great spirit, Narayana, the soul of the universe, Maha Sarasvati, goddess of wisdom, essence of self, to manifest radiant health, vibrant health, glowing health, to manifest deep inner peace, equanimity, serenity. May peace and justice prevail for all. Uh, today our, our, our topic is higher intelligence. Intelligence is the ability to learn. Okay, we'll just take a very simple definition of intelligence as the ability to learn. And in, in nature, every uh, 
atom, every molecule, every cell, every organism is, is a feedback loop, uh, is a cybernetic mechanism that maintains a uh, homeostatic uh, uh, homeostasis. And uh, so in a sense, we can picture that something like this here so that we can uh, we can say that every atom every molecule every cell involves a, a nucleus and the energy moves out into the nucleus into a field and then returns back to the source that uh, every atom every molecule every cell every natural every biological process is a feedback loop that maintains a, a homeostasis that uh, uh, is a cybernetic mechanism. So this is our definition of, of intelligence. This is our definition of intelligence, the ability to learn. So that every atom, every molecule, every cell uh, is a nucleus, has a nucleus without pictures, uh, a homeostasis, a balance takes in the experience of its environment, and then self-corrects in the next cycle. So this recursiveness is our definition of intelligence. So you could say that every atom, every molecule, every cell is made of intelligence, um, and that there is, in fact, a self-organizing self intelligence, which is at the heart of every atom, every molecule, every cell, every organism, that... Um, Everything in creation uh, is this self-organizing intelligence. Uh, the Upanishads are the ancient esoteric texts uh, that are a comment on the ancient Vedas. Ved means to know and are some of our uh, oldest and most coherent uh, philosophical and spiritual works that we have on our planet Earth. Um, in one of the principal Upanishads, these ex esoteric treatises, uh, the Kaustaki Brahmana, the god Indra, the king of heaven, is asked for a boon deemed to be the most beneficial for mankind. Sri Indra exhorts, understand me only, and reveals the doctrine of the supremacy of intelligence. Now listen carefully for what Indra, the king of the heaven, points out. For verily without intelligence, speech does not make known to the self any name whatsoever. My mind was elsewhere, he said. I did not cognize that name. For verily without intelligence, the mind doesn't, uh, isn't present. For verily without intelligent breath does not make known any odor whatsoever, because unless you're present, you don't smell. My mind was elsewhere, he says, I did not cognize that odor. For verily without intelligence, the ear does not make known any sound whatsoever. My mind was elsewhere, he says. I did not cognize That's, that sound. So it's cognizance. The ability to be aware, the ability to be present, is the, uh, is the, uh, is the essence of, of this intelligence. That unless this intelligence, this cognizance, this presence is there, the ears don't hear, the eyes don't see, the tongue doesn't taste, again, uh, Indra goes on, Verily, if there were no element of intelligence, there would be no element of existence that it is this presence, this awareness, this cognizance uh, that allows us, that is that the root of our experience. And this is why sages call this cognizance the self. And Indra goes on to say, for as in a chariot, the feli, that's the rim, is fixed on the spokes, and the spokes are fixed on the hub, even so these elements of existence are fixed on the elements of intelligence. And the elements of intelligence are fixed uh, in the breathing spirit. The same breathing spirit is truly the intelligent self. Bliss, ageless, immortal. So, 
the ancient Upanishads the ancient Upanishads point out that there is an intelligence in each of us, a cognizance, an awareness, a presence that we don't taste, we don't see, we don't touch, we don't feel unless we are present in that experience. And that presence, uh, that cognizance, they describe as pure intelligence, the ability to be present, to that is the, the part of us um, that is actually cognizant, that is actually aware of our experience. That is the, in a sense, it is the being. Uh, in a sense, it's the actual life in each of us. Because again, if we go back to our uh, field here, every field is defined uh, by this intelligence, uh, that the field is uh, articulating a, uh, a, a state of homeostasis and then taking that experience back into self-correction. And this is at the root of every natural, every biological process. And it's also at the root of what we're doing in each moment where we are uh, out picturing uh, our whatever we're doing, taking in the feedback from the world around us, self-correcting and integ integrating that into our experience. We're learning, and this is our definition of intelligence. And it's with that in mind that I would say that we, we, um, we, um, the, the stuff of creation seems to be this self-organizing intelligence. In the uh, Sanatana Dharma, uh, we, our, our paradigm is much different than the paradigm in the West. In the West, we have a deist paradigm where divinity lies outside of creation. And in uh, the wisdom of ancient India and the wisdom of most traditional people, as I understand it, a divinity doesn't lie outside of creation. The creation is a self-sacrifice of the divine. So in the wisdom of ancient India, the goddess becomes creation. Creation is the body of the goddess. Uh, creation is the eminence of the divine. Um, so, uh, so the goddess gives herself totally and fully to creation. So when we talk about this intelligence, as a self-organizing intelligence, or the intelligence which is at the heart of every atom and molecule and cell of creation, uh, we see this uh, as divinity herself. We see this as the presence of the great mystery. Now, the, we, when we start to talk about these questions, we really uh, these are uh, these are questions without an answer in a sense, you know, when did all this begin? Everything in nature is cyclical. It's really profound conjecture to presuppose uh, a beginning uh, to all of this, and perhaps even to presuppose an end to all of this, because nature and everything that we experience in life is, is cyclical. Uh, so we are going to uh, say this is a question that we're going to just assume Take, uh, take as an assumption rather than go any further and to say that we can posit a self-organizing intelligence at the heart of everything rather than choose to describe some God. Where did that God come from? Um, uh, something can't come from nothing. So, oh, there was a bigger God who created that God and then a bigger God who created that God. Mm, Proto-God created God. Yeah. So we have to just uh, take our own experience that there appears to be in our experience. There's a self-organizing intelligence at the nucleus, at the heart of everything that, that makes it uh, what it is and, uh, and point to the universality in nature of this intelligence and recognize it as a higher intelligence. 
And in our own experience, this is the, the same intelligence that's in the atom, the molecule, the cell. It's the same intelligence. It is a cognizance. It is in the presence in us uh, in this uh, macrocosm. In another one of the uh, ancient uh, Upanishads, the, uh, in the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad, which is considered to be the most important of the Upanishads, the sage Yajna Valka explains, as a mass of salt is without inside, without outside, is altogether a mass of taste, even so verily is this self without inside, without outside, altogether a mass of intelligence only. So here the... Uh, Sage Yajna Valkya, in uh, perhaps the most revered of the Upanishads, is again articulating the doctrine of the supremacy of intelligence and articulating that the stuff of creation is this self-organizing intelligence that every atom, every molecule, every cell, every organism is this fabric of divine intelligence, is this goddess who has become a creation. In the Sanatana Dharma, the question is how do we, um, how do we focus our, our, our consciousness? So uh, they have cultivated these icons which personify the powers of creation and the forces of nature. Um, here we're looking at an icon of the goddess Sarasvati. And Sarasvati uh, translates as essence of self. So we're looking at a goddess who is the personification of the essence of ourselves. And whenever you see uh, an icon of the goddess Sarasvati, you will usually see uh, a goose or a swan, which is her celestial uh, vehicle. And the swan is the uh, reputed to be the highest flying bird. Actually, these, these, uh, there's some geese that fly at 30 to 35,000 feet as they fly from Siberia across uh, India to nest in Africa. So the, 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 the goose or the swan uh, is the highest flying bird symbolizes the supreme principle, the highest principle, the ultimate principle. And in this case, the swan, uh, which in Sanskrit is called Hansa, um, uh, uh, symbolizes the breath. And again, the breath is, is called the, the natural mantra uh, because in each breath we are uttering... <gasps> And this Hansa of the breath is the mantra of the highest flying swan. So we take the breath as the supreme principle, uh, as the root principle in this creation. And uh, the meaning of uh, this is that the breath is the vehicle of this intelligence which we personify as the goddess Sarasvati, that this intelligence this divine intelligence, uh, her vehicle is the swan. And the self-organizing intelligence of creation, uh, the vehicle of that is the breath of life. And that everything that, that lives is sustained by the breath of life. And we're calling the organizing intelligence whose vehicle is the um, breath of life, the essence of self. The Sarasvati. So Sarasvati personifies the creative intelligence, uh, the all-pervasive creative intelligence whose vehicle is the breath and uh, sustains uh, life. Now you see that uh, the goddess is playing the veena, is playing the music of creation in the uh, understanding of ancient India, the Sanatana Dharma, the world is sung into creation, the world is music. 
and as uh, we are students of subtle energy, it's important to appreciate that our subtle body is a musical body. Our etheric body is a, a musical body. That the medium of ether is sound. Everyone uh, who studied the elements understands that the ether element it fills all space, that the medium of ether is sound, and the other elements as sound step down uh, from uh, the etheric field. So to talk about the etheric body, to talk about the subtle body, is to talk about uh, a sonic body, that we live in a, a tuniverse. So the, the music of creation is being played by, by essence of self. And again, the goddess Sarasvati is of playing the music of creation. So how does the breath play this music of creation? Well, I believe that one of the most important things I ever figured out uh, as I sought to understand the play of the elements, the elemental keynotes, uh, ether, air, fire, water, earth, the elemental harmonics, which define, which define earth, solidity, water, the medium for life, Fire, the transformation, the working energy. Air, the intelligence, the feedback loop. And ether, the overall space within the larger spaces of uh, time and space. Um, that uh, the five elements were the lingua franca of the science of the ancients and cross-culturally and trans-historically, all of the ancient cultures in some form or another work with these elemental keynotes work with these elemental harmonics. So as we breathe the body, uh, so Sarasvati, uh, the intelligence which rides on the breath, uh, is playing the, the vena of creation, that musical instruments have always traditionally been made of guts and hide, and we're arguing that the breath plays the musical instrument of the body, that is, we breathe on a molecular, on an atomic, on a cellular level. First of all, as we breathe in, the tissue stretches into an attunement, uh, which we call um, air, and air resonates with a higher intelligence of the soul, and the soul steps down uh, into air. Uh, and air is the feedback mechanism, which is uh, embodied in the nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, so air is this intelligence, this presence, this cognizance. And then as the, we continue to breathe, the tissue moves from this elongation into entrainment with the solar force. And the tissue entrains with fire, the, the power, the creativity, uh, the passion. Uh, of the human condition. Then as we continue to breathe, the tissue uh, 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 moves into a still point, balancing the forces within, without, above and below that we call earth, where energy crystallizes into form, and then the tissue as a cycle of the breath contracts into a lunar attunement, which we call water a cleansing, a releasing, a crystallizing of consciousness into form, and then back in its cycle uh, to its neutral source. So every breath is a process of natural and cosmic attunement to these universal keynotes of manifestation, ether, the overall space, air, the intelligence that is the fills that space, uh, fire, the transformational working energy in that space, water, the living medium that sustains that, and earth, the boundaries. Um, and these are, uh, these are uh, musical notes in a tuniverse, musical notes in the order of creation. Now, <clears throat> The principal philosophy, one of the principal philosophies, there are seven uh, orthodox philosophies in the Sanatana Dharma. And one of the principal philosophies, and uh, it's, 
it's truly one of the most popular today, is the, the philosophy of Advaita, Advaita, A-D-V-E-D-A, uh, Advaita, I'm not much of a speller. And Advaita means not to, it's the philosophy of non-dualism. It's a philosophy of, of, of oneness. And Advaita <clears throat> is a philosophy which has attracted some of the greatest minds in history and certainly attracts many of us today. And again, uh, Advaita is a philosophy of radical, radical monism. It's Advaita saying there is not, there is not duality, that everything is made of, 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 of a oneness. Now, traditionally, <clears throat> the, root, the root philosophy of, of India is called Sankhya, which is the root philosophy of, uh, of, of India and then most of Asia. It's the basis of both Buddhism and Hinduism, this ancient, ancient Sankhya, which means to enumerate. And Sankhya is dualistic. It presupposes uh, uh, two dimensions, uh, Purusha, which is spirit, the intelligence in everyone and everything, the life in everyone and everything, and prakriti, which is nature, everything else that isn't uh, spirit, that isn't the divine intelligence, and, uh, and a, a duality between uh, subject, purusha, uh, cognizance, and, uh, and prakriti, nature, the goddess, uh, manifestation. But Advaita uh, rejects this duality and it's articulated in the most profound way in the, by the 12th century philosopher Adi Shankar. Shankara. Uh, and Shankara in the crest jewel of discrimination uh, offers us one of the most uh, primordial uh, discussions uh, of this uh, profound philosophy. But in any case, um, Advaita would argue that there's just a, this one intelligence, that everything is made of this intelligence. Um, and, um, and that the substance of creation is this intelligence, as we were looking at in these two Upanishads uh, that we uh, focused on, that everything is made of this uh, higher intelligence, everything is made of this self sacrifice of the goddess. Again, in the Sanatana Dharma, they, uh, one of the fundamental views of creation is uh, in terms of what are called the gunas. Uh, the word guna comes from the Sanskrit root giri, which means a vortex. Uh, like a whirlwind of energy. Usually, guna is translated as quality. Uh, but this, uh, according to Theos Barnard, great scholar of Sanskrit, as good as we've had in the West, the founder of the Sanskrit department at Columbia, uh, some believe that he was the incarnation of Padma Sambhava. Uh, some, there's an amazing book about his life called The White Lama. And uh, he was the first Westerner to be uh, invited to visit Tibet and uh, charged with the great responsibility of being this Padmasambhava to bring the uh, wisdom, ancient Tibetan wisdom, to the West. But in any case, uh, in, uh, in Theos Barnard's book on Hindu philosophy, he tells us that this word uh, guna comes from an Indo-European root giri, which means vortex, or, or field. And in Sankhya, um, the root of Sankhya uh, is this, uh, are the three gunas. Uh, and the three gunas are sattva, the force of equilibrium in nature, rajas, uh, the fire the, of creativity, and tamas, uh, the crystallization of consciousness into matter. So neutral, Sattva, positive rajas, and negative tamas. Uh, 
I like to think of this in terms of the breath. So here we have this, the stillness of the breath connecting to the source is the neutral, the expansive breath uh, that resonates with the sun, Rajas, and the contracting breath that resonates with the lunar force, with the earth and moon, Tamas. So we're looking at, uh, here we see a picture from the amazing uh, micro-clairvoyant scholar, uh, Edwin I. Babbitt. We're looking at Babbitt's Adam. Babbitt was a micro-clairvoyant who witnessed the fundamental processes of creation. <coughs> And I want you to picture this, uh, this uh, atom as a, a, a living, breathing, vibrant field of energy. And again, moving uh, from an uh, inward communion with an oversoul, a higher dimension, uh, which we call sattva guna, the force of equilibrium, communing with being, and then radiating out in the breath as the breath expands into a solar attunement, which we call rajas guna, and then contracting into a lunar attunement and a crystallization of consciousness and energy into form. So everything in creation is breathing, every atom, every molecule, every cell, every organism in this tuniverse is breathing through this cycle of natural and cosmic attunement of sattva, soul communion, communion with the higher organizing intelligence of the mystery which is outside of this dimension, uh, and then radiating into, uh, as it continues to breathe, like a Hawaiian guitar, stretching into a tune with the solar force and uh, inspiration. Again, uh, our Latin word spiritus, uh, uh, which means breath. Our word spiral, uh, again, comes from the Latin spiritus, breath, inspiration, respiration. So as we inspire, we respire, we're attuned in respiration to the breath of life, to this higher intelligence. Uh, and the inspiration in that fiery inspiration of attunement with the solar force. And then as the diaphragm descends, the field falls into fall, into attunement, with the, uh, uh, what we call the lunar force of the earth and water elements of tamas guna, the negative field. So this is why Dr. Stone called his uh, study of, um, of energy, polarity, because energy always moves from a neutral source into a field of expression and then uh, crystallizes uh, into form and then is drawn back into the source that every breath is this moving from neutral to positive uh, to uh, negative and then back into its source. Every cycle is the cycle of the breath. I've uh, spent the greater part of my adult life in a body of wisdom that's been called uh, polarity therapy and is a uh, and is uh, the fruit of the life work of Dr. Randolph Stone, who many consider to be the father of energy medicine in the West. Uh, and um, and polarity therapy is unique as a healing art for the intention to address the, the soul and the root principles of polarity therapy. Dr. Stone explains that unless you have uh, addressed this organizing intelligence, uh, that uh, you haven't really reached a level that, that, that affects healing. That healing is about making a, a, a change in the, in the body's relationship to its, its nucleus. Uh, in the body's relationship to this organizing intelligence. So that um, in my book, Esoteric Anatomy, The Body is Consciousness, uh, we really develop uh, Dr. Stone's work uh, quite a bit and uh, and I highly recommend it if you'd like to go deeper into these ideas and into a discussion of uh, uh, these uh, images which we're touching upon. But polarity therapy is unique as a healing art 
for the intention to address the soul, the animating intelligence. Dr. Stone likened the soul to the nucleus of the energy field. Uh, that again, it was the organizing intelligence and at the heart of this feedback loop uh, which defines life, this feedback loop of intelligence. Now, in polarity, we, we address the soul holistically. So we have what we call the energy balancing body work. And the purpose of the body work is to facilitate an experience of balanced energy and soul communion. Because again, every atom of your body has a potential to be a well to being. That when the gunas are in harmony, they are a well to being. They are a, a portal to receive the, the, the vitality, the wholeness, the blessings uh, of the soul that the purpose of our energy balancing is to potentize our relationship to the soul. To Again, potentize means to bring the field into more coherence, more harmony, so that we can receive the potential uh, of the higher dimension, of, of uh, the finer forces of higher intelligence. So we do this through energy balancing body work, again, to cultivate sattva guna, that, that the fields will be vibrating with the force of equilibrium in nature. We also have very, very powerful dietary regimes, and a dietary regime called the polarity diet, where we only eat sattvic. It's a cleansing diet to again bring the body into communion with a higher level of its own innate intelligence. A third aspect of polarity therapy are our energy exercises. Again, your body is a, an atom, your body is a, a molecule, your body is a cell in the body of nature, in the body of Gaia. And that the field around us, the subtle universal elements, step down through the joints. And the range of motion and mobility of the joints is one of the keys to our health and well-being. So that we have this system of energy exercises, and I recommend you check out my YouTube video on energy exercises, easy energy exercises. Uh, um, and, and the purpose of these exercises is to enhance the fluid, fluidity, the flexibility, the ease and the range of motion of the joints, because the joints are another place where a universal uh, where this universal life steps down from the energy fields of nature and the cosmos around us into the energy fields of our body. Um, that again, the word Greek word atmosphere. Uh, atmos means breath. The atmosphere around the, the earth is the life breath of a living uh, earth and the earth is is breathing through these subtle universal harmonics uh, which are etheric in their nature and they step down to sustain our physical body and our body has its being in attunement with these subtle universal harmonics. Uh, but any system that cultivates the fluidity and the mobility of the joints uh, is one of the keys to a pain-free, a healthy, an active, a vibrant uh, life. Uh, so in our understanding, okay, I'll just leave it at that. I think I went into how that steps down in the previous video in this uh, series. And the fourth element of the system of energy balancing body work, energy balancing cleansing diet, energy balancing exercise, the fourth, fourth element of this is this knowledge. And a big part of the work I do is to topple the dominant uh, paradigm, uh, which denies the spirituality uh, of, of our life here on earth and, uh, and is a, a materialistic uh, view of the world and a view of our life. I've been, uh, I'm, I'm uh, I'm a, uh, 
a carbon Bigfoot, unfortunately. I've uh, made the choice to go to India virtually every year for the last oh, more than 40 years. Uh, at first, it was a quest. It was a quest to understand why this human condition is so painful. And it was a quest to somehow go beyond that pain. And in recent years, as uh, I fortunately have left that pain behind, it's been a quest for the deepest kind of understanding uh, of the human condition. One of my teachers uh, is a sage by the name, or was a sage, he's no longer in the body, Harilal Punja, uh, affectionately known as uh, Papaji. And I want to talk about Papaji because on one hand, if you go to his uh, three-volume biography, Nothing Ever Happened, by David Godman, you'll see that at every point in his life, he's seeking to go beyond. Now, when he was, I think, five or seven years old, he had an experience of the absolute. A direct experience of unit of consciousness. But he believed his mother, who filled his head with what we called spiritual glamour, with image of, of Radha and Krishna, of Sita and Rama. And he spent the, the next 40 years of his life dancing with Krishna, playing with Rama in what any of us would consider the most exalted and blessed state. But then he met his, his guru, Guru Ramana, in Tiruvannamalai in India, who posed him the question, do you, do you want to worship a god that comes and goes? And invited him to go deeper and to find that which doesn't appear or disappear, that which has no other cause And Papaji contemplated that and opened to a, a direct experience of the Absolute. Now, I, again, I, it may be presumptuous of me to describe the whole of the, of, uh, the legends of the Sanatana Dharma as spiritual glamour. But if it distracts you, from your own realization of the Absolute as profound and as blissful and as wonderful as it is. Uh, you know, Papaji had this experience of the Absolute when he was five or seven years old and yet he spends the next 30 or 40 years dancing with Krishna, playing with Sita and Rama, and he only is realized again. He only allows himself to be realized again. So I, I take that as a lesson for all of us, that we are so, uh, you know, Osho says that every concept of the divine that we have is a hallucination. If we're talking about non-duality, if we're talking about oneness, we're not, we're denying that there is a, a subject-object split. Where we're, uh, that seer and seen, seer, seeing, and seen are the same, are a seamless fabric of intelligence. So if you, uh, now it seems to me that many of our, uh, Guru Ramana's disciples are, are involved in, uh, in, in his, method or a method that is attributed to him of self-inquiry but it but it, it i don't know how you transcend the duality of that and simply say accept the seer seen and seeing are are one uh, that it's seamless that it's advaita it's non-dual it's a it's a it's a oneness and that there is a uh, 
a, a great mystery, which sages have described as intelligence, as cognizance, as presence, as awareness, um, which is at the heart of everyone. It's the same intelligence, the same cognizance in everyone. In fact, uh, I see it in terms of uh, sages tell us that this intelligence is unborn, undying, everywhere, always eternal, forever and ever and ever. So the life in you is unborn, undying, eternal, forever and ever, and that you and I are the flowers and the fruit on this tree of eternal life. Now, sometimes I have a lot of trouble with this word G-O-D. It, it seems to be so laden with baggage and uh, so surrounded by uh, spiritual glamour and spiritual gobbledygook and the blind leading the deaf. It's, it's really an intense, intense word, G-O-D. <laughs> um, and yet it, uh, we... we we're drawn back to it's uh, it's just such an easy symbol to use, and it refers to just so much. Unfortunately, it isn't a very clear term. It's very, it's a subject of great great debate. Uh, many years ago, I have a wonderful wonderful teacher who lives in uh, Rishikesh the city of uh, sages on the banks of the Ganga outside of Rishikesh in a little village called Tapawan, busy place of pilgrimage. And we were visiting a, a, a cousin of hers who lived in an, uh, an ashram in Hardwar. Hardwar is very nearby. Hardwar means gateway to liberation, either Hari or Hara, that Vishnu or Shiva, it is the gateway to liberation from the ignorance and from the wheel of samsara. And we were visiting, uh, and many, many, many uh, traditional Hindus come to Hardwar to pass their last years on the banks of the Ganga and pursue liberation. And we were visiting this uh, cousin of my teacher, uh, Mother Vanamali, and she lived in a um, uh, an ashram. A play, ashram means a place of aspiration on the banks of the Holy River Ganga in Hardwar. And, and we were chatting there in the garden. And uh, my teacher's cousin said, you must meet my neighbor. And this tiny little woman came out dressed in just a, a gray pantsuit, and she smiled, and she was just radiating just so much love, just more love. Than... So I kind of globbed onto her and wouldn't let her be. And the following year, I came back to Hardwar to spend time with her, and I, it was a turning point in my life. One afternoon, we sat in the garden of the ashram, and, and I asked her, I said, Mataji, how can I see God in everyone? And she explained to me, now this woman, it turns out, was the mistress of the ashram. The master had passed on, has left his body, and everyone had asked her to lead them to be their spiritual heart. But this tiny little woman, un unpresuming being, had been a physicist by trade and had been the, the dean of her college before she uh, sought the contemplative life in an ashram. So this is no naive answer that I'm getting. So I said, Mataji, how can I see God in everyone and everything? And she explained that, that God is life. that God is the life in everyone and everything. And it's so, so simple. We must remember that we've all been brainwashed by monotheism 
which substituted, which demanded that we adhere to um, an abstract philosophical concept of God and deny the sacred in the life around us and the life within us and that we've been brainwashed for, for millennia by this materialist paradigm to somehow think that we are material beings seeking our spirituality rather than uh, spiritual beings uh, seeking to throw off the cloak of ignorance and the cloak of this uh, worldview, this dominant paradigm, uh, so over, over programmed in science and over, over programmed in the uh, uh, world around us. Another very interesting um, perspective on this question of G.O.D. is the wisdom of this tremendous sage, Mahatma Gandhi, Mahatma, great Atma, great being. Gandhi came to understand that truth was God, that rather than God being some abstract philosophical concept, that when we practice truth in our life, we experience the sacred. That in our gesture of kindness, our gesture of caring, our gesture of creativity, our gesture of respect or love or service, there is an inherent experience of the sacred in that gesture. That when we live truthfully, we could live a life of Dharma. We could live a life, a, a sacred life that in a life of health, caring for this gift of this body, in a, a life of service, caring for the people around us, uh, uh, there's an inherent sacredness in our acts of uh, kindness, and compassion, and respect, and generosity, and care, that, uh, that God wasn't a concept, couldn't be found in the heavens, but we could practice experiencing the divine, experiencing the sacred. As we cared for life and as we practiced the sacred life. So I want to talk a little bit now about the upcoming program in India. Uh, each January, I lead a group in India for 18 days in Tiruvannamalai, South India, uh, just outside of town in a beautiful new retreat center. And uh, if you're seeking in the wisdom of India, in Sankhya, it says that the pain that we're in is because of a condition of ignorance, that the pain that we're in is because of the incredible vulnerability of, of a life divorced from our divinity, from a life alienated from nature, a life alienated from our own sacred essence, that the self-hatred, the self-loathing, the fear, the terror, the insecurity is rooted in our disconnect from being, our alienation from our own divine self. So, the work that we do, the healing work that we do, the transformational work that we do in this 18-day program in the heartland of Mother India is a process of to change the way you are vibrating on a molecular level so that you come into soul communion, come into communion with your divinity, and you learn to recognize that. Because, you see, we have... We have uh, we have uh, points in our time, uh, points in life, we're in communion with the self, where every atom of our body is a well of being. And when we fall out of attunement with that, when we fall out of that state of great fullness, that state of feeling wonderful, this is our natural state, to feel grateful, to literally feel the greatness of being on a molecular level, to be in soul communion, of feeling wonderful, filled with the wonder of this gift of life, filled with the wonder of this presence. When we fall 
out of this. We feel like there's something terribly wrong. We feel terribly vulnerable. We try, oh, if only I had more money, if I only had more sex, if I only had more love, if I only had more health, if I only had more wealth, if I only had this, that. And yet we get those things and they do not uh, solve the fundamental questions. So this is a course uh, that sages promise will put you on the road to the total, the final, the permanent, the complete annihilation of your suffering, the suffering that's rooted in your ignorance of your divinity through a molecular change that is promulgated through the energy balancing. balancing. So uh, we'll spend uh, four days learning giving and receiving energy balancing protocols, doing energy exercises, eating sattvic food, breathing in the energy of the sacred holy place. Then we go on pilgrimage for two days, and practice, relax for two days, then we come back and, uh, and do energy balancing to dissolve emotional armoring and to uh, align our core with the ultrasound, the higher uh, vibrational intelligence of the soul. Take another two days to integrate, shop, tourism, and then in the last four days we do a system of soul retrieval, a profound uh, synthesis of transpersonal and somatic psychology, which we call rescuing the inner child. In the last half century, psychology in the West has been transformed by the work of a man by the name of Dr. Eugene Genlin. he Many consider him the most important American philosopher of the 20th century. He's equally, he is as important as Freud was for pointing to the subconscious or pansexuality. Genlin articulated the power of somatics. Before Genlin, so much psychotherapy was rarely, 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 rarely valuable. Rarely did it bring lasting change or uh, change that made a difference in people's lives. Genlin had a grant to study thousands of therapy sessions that he recorded. And what he found out was, it, uh, was the clients who took the therapeutic context as an opportunity to be present in their bodily experience were able to clear the past. And he created a system of psychotherapy without psychotherapists called focusing. And Genlin's work, which became the foundation of Peter Levine's important work in somatic experiencing, and the whole movement since then to turn towards the body, to understand that, uh, that uh, trauma is held in a much deeper level than the mind, the neocortex, which comes late in evolution, or even the limbic system, which comes later in evolution, but in this primordial somatic level. So the work that we do in these last four days, somatic emotional clearing, addresses the level on which we hold, hold trauma. And again, you don't have to experience the trauma. You only need to experience that it's safe to be present in your body. Trauma is the body's holding of its experience of the trauma. And it's feeling unsafe to be fully alive, breathing, and present. And all you need to do to release the trauma is not to relive or reenact the trauma in any way but to simply experience it's safe to breathe, to be alive, to be present, and that clears and releases the trauma. So we teach this incredibly safe and powerful way of clearing the past, uh, and we integrate this into an incredible system of, uh, of soul retrieval where we're guided by higher intelligence to the subconscious contents that are the key to your healing, and we reframe this. Uh, we reframe these contexts. In a, in a system of creating a conscious and nourishing relationship with a vulnerable part of your being, which we call somatic emotional clearing. So I hope you'll visit my website, www.weareone.us, W-E-R-E, the numeral one, dot U-S. 
www.were1.us, where you can sign up for our newsletter um, or find out more about this course, January 8th to 25th in Turvanamalai in South India. It's in Tamil Nadu near Chennai, near Madras. And um, your, my email address is there. My phone number is there. You're welcome to call me if you'd like to find out more about this. Um, it's truly my, my blessing in life to, uh, to uh, share this wisdom with you and share this amazing, amazing uh, system of energy medicine, of transformational therapy, uh, to empower you to take responsibility for your own life and to empower you <clears throat> to be a healing force in the lives around you, uh, of the people around you as you learn these principles and these amazing techniques. Well, I want to thank you for tuning in today and spending some uh, time with us. I hope you'll visit uh, the website to find out more about uh, our upcoming course in Tirvanamalai. Uh, also, if you have any, uh, you might check out my book, Esoteric Anatomy. You can get a, a paperback cover, or it's also a Kindle book. It's uh, translated to Greek and uh, Portuguese, Russian, uh, Polish, uh, if you like. And I think there's even a, may even be an Italian uh, uh, version uh, available uh, on demand printing. Well, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity today to rave about the mystery. I'm uh, constantly learning new things about the software I'm using. And I appreciate your uh, patience with the process. Om Namah Shivaya. God is blessed. We dedicate our efforts to a vision of a springtime of humanity, where all humanity makes a leap in consciousness and realizes the unity and divinity of all life, where we cherish our Mother Earth as our own mother, where we share with each other as brothers and sisters. For all our relations, aho matakwiasi, so be it. Thank you. Suki no Babantu Loka Samasta Suki no